Morning, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, for this Lunch and Learn session, with, um, we're lucky to have Sarah Price from CODA join us. Um, I saw Sarah present at the National Passive House Conference, and I'm sure if there was ever to be a National Retrofit Conference, then she'd be asked to speak um, there too. Sarah's going to reference a number of case studies, whole house retrofit case studies from social housing providers, among them River Clyde Homes, Connexus and Orbit Heart um, of England. Sarah wears many hats. Um, she um, technical advisor at, at CODA, um, a chartered engineer, a technical advisor for the AECB and the Passive House Trust. And she has worked as a technical author and technical advisor for multiple building frameworks and guides. Um, before we start, I will admit more people. Um, before we start, can I politely ask that everyone leaves their mics on mute, please? Um, but please use the chat function to ask any questions, introduce yourselves, say why you're here. Um, this session is being recorded and I'll upload it to Meshwork tomorrow. Um, it's going to be about 45 minutes or so for this lunch and learn session. Sarah has a presentation and then, then please use the chat function to ask any questions. Um, but yeah, without further ado, good morning, Sarah. Thanks for joining us. Um, let me name, well, let me stop sharing my screen so then you can share your screen and um, yeah, I'll hand the reins over to you. Lovely, thank you. Um, let me make you all a bit bigger. If you'd like to have your cameras on, it's wonderful to be able to see faces, <laughs> but don't feel you have to. Um, so, yeah, sometimes you feel as if you're talking to no one. Over here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and maybe you're all eating and you don't want me to see you eating. That's probably what I'd be doing in fairness. Um, right. So, yeah, uh, so this is a presentation I did at the Passive House Conference. Um, going to cover a lot of different retrofit standards and a few projects that I've worked on. So um, a lot to squeeze in. So hopefully you'll have some questions at the end. The first project I want to talk about is was my very first retrofit project, my very first passive house project. Um, it happened to be a passive house retrofit and it was a pilot project done by Orbit Heart of England. Um, at the time I was working for NCraft and we also worked with the architects IDP ID part partnership. So um, they really wanted to have a look and see what NFIT looked like, passive house retrofit looked like, and then also whether we could do a more affordable version of it as well. Um, so there was a pair of semis that we took in, in this image here, the thermographic image, and they are no fines concrete. So as you can imagine, really leaky buildings, um, very poor air tightness. Um, and what you can see there on that image, so the red patches under the windows, that's the radiators. So you can see where the radiators are from the outside of the building, such as the, the building fabric being so poor at keeping heat in. So if we have a look at the difference between the passive house retrofit, the Enerfit, and then the affordable 40K version, I say affordable 40K, Clearly, if you're going to scale this up and roll it out, it's not going to cost you 40K. Um, this was because it was a pilot project. It was a one off. We had several architects involved because it was a learning project as well. Um, they also introduced sort of extra features they wanted to try out that weren't necessarily to do with the building fabric. Um, so things like on the passive house one, we had solar tiles, uh, which is not a passive house requirement, but they really wanted to try out these, these solar PV tiles on the roof. So um, the biggest differences are probably in the insulation. So we had less external wall insulation on the more affordable retrofit, 100 mil and 200 mil on the passive house one. You can just see the step there in the bottom photo between the insulation, which is quite nicely hidden by the guttering actually now, so you hardly notice it. Um, the loft was insulated at ceiling level on the more affordable one, but we had a new truss roof um, and that was for several reasons. That was partly to support the, the PV um, and partly because we needed to extend the roof anyway to overhang the 200 mil of insulation. So we could get 100 mil under the existing roof. We couldn't get 200 mil under the existing eaves. So um, new truss roof was put on and we insulated up um, in line with the pitch of the roof rather than flat at ceiling level. And then the other big cost is digging out the floor. 
So if you want to get floor insulation in a solid floor property and you don't have the ceiling height, you don't really have any other option other than to dig down. And so that's what we did. Um, we dug down in the passive house one and we, we put in at least 100 mil of insulation. I can't remember exactly how much it is now. But we didn't put any floor insulation in the affordable one because there simply wasn't the ceiling height to do it. We had new triple glaze windows and doors in the um, Enerfit passive house retrofit. And we had the existing double glaze windows and doors in the more affordable one. But they were bought out into the insulation layer. So they actually moved the existing windows and doors in line with the insulation to avoid that thermal bridge. Didn't do anything about air tightness. Um, obviously, you have to do a lot about air tightness if you want to achieve passive house levels. And if we take a look at the building services, um, so for a passive house, any passive house, retrofit or new build, you, you in, in our climate, you need mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. And that's what that is in that top photo. So that is in the warm, the now warm loft space, which you can see is insulated at pitch level. And the bottom photo is the radiator. So we had two radiators in that dwelling and they were both that size for the whole of the passive house and that provided enough heating. Um, we had gas condensing combi boilers in both of them. Um, and then obviously we had the solar PV tiles, which I mentioned earlier. So the biggest cost difference there is our um, MVHR system. So it's probably about 10,000 pounds, something like that to fit an MVHR system in a house of this size, whereas single room fans are going to be a few hundred pounds. So um, we have a sorry, Sarah, Sarah, I just sorry to interrupt there, but just it just seems there has been one question uh, just in talking about how much more beneficial um, 200 mil insulation is compared to 100 mil insulation. I just thought before we went on to, to another case study, it'd be quite good just to um, answer that question there, if that's OK. Well, I think these figures probably tell you how much more <laughs> beneficial it is. So it, it, the answer is it all adds up. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of as you know, diminishing returns when it comes to insulation. So if you already had a property with 100 mil of insulation on, you probably wouldn't retrofit it because it's, it, you know, the returns that you get are so small. Sure. But if you've got a property with no insulation on, it's not a lot more cost, you know, costly to put 200 mil on than the 100 mil on because you're there on site already, you've got the scaffolding up, you yeah. know, you're paying for the extra materials essentially. Um, so if we have a look at the figures, what's interesting is that um, after we retrofit these two properties side by side, so they're almost identical, the modelled annual fuel bill reduction was 84% in the passive house one, a huge chunk off their energy bills, and uh, that's space heating, um, and then 36% in the more affordable one, so massive difference there. And then the carbon emissions reduction similar. So 85% for the passive house one and 34% for the more affordable one. Now, interestingly, if you work out the pounds per tonne of carbon saved, it's exactly the same for both. So if you take the total cost of the project and divide it by the tonnes of carbon that you saved, you get 632 pounds tonnes of carbon. And, the, and it's got exactly the same payback period as well, mm. 100 years payback. So as I say, these... I mean, you go to this level of, of retrofit on an individual property and the costs don't really stack up, you know, 100 year payback period. That's a really, really long time. Um, so let's have a look at some other projects. But uh, if we just go through what we're doing now at the moment in terms of cost effective retrofit in the UK. So we've we've just had a look at passive house retrofit benefit, but I just put this slide in here just in case some of you were not aware of exactly what that means to go to passive house standards. We've seen we've got to have mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. It's got to be really airtight. So air tightness less than one air changes. Typically, we're about five um, air permeability, which is roughly equivalent actually in um, domestic housing. And the space heating demand has got to be less than 25 kilowatt hours per meter squared annum. So really, really quite low. I've got a lovely graph later so you can see the scale of all the standards. Um, and it really is only cost effective for medium to large scale projects. So there have been some very interesting passive house retrofit projects, including the, this one, this photo. Mm -hmm. You might recognize this. This is Wilmcote House. Um, I think it's the largest benefit project in the world. Um, and it is in the UK. Uh, and it's um, in down in Portsmouth. 
so that becomes a lot more cost effective because passive house is based on uh, form factor. So you're looking at how much heat loss area there is compared to internal floor area. You, you can see a huge building like that. And actually the U values don't need to be that low. You know, so you're, you're looking at building regs type U values to achieve passive house retrofit. Still need to do the air tightness and the thermal bridging, and you still need to have the MVHR systems. And so those are the challenges. It becomes the building services really that becomes the challenge rather than the building fabric. I'll talk a bit about that later on because I've got a, a large scale project that we can go and have a look at. Um, and then I want to come on to the AECB building standards. So the AECB, if you've not come across them, is the Association for Environment Conscious Building. And they actually bought Passive House into the UK and they set up the Passive House Trust. And they, before even Passive House came to the UK, they had these standards that were based on the Passive House Institute standards and they were called gold and silver. Some of you might remember them. Um, well, the gold standard became Passive House in the UK. And ACB Silver is still around. So that's the ACB new build standard that we have now. So um, they've just launched a retrofit standard as well. And now they're all based on Passive House methodology. You have to use the Passive House design tool um, to pass it. Um, but it's slow take up. You know, there's only 33 ACB building standard projects registered at the moment. Um, and there's no retrofit projects because it was only launched last year, this retrofit standard. Um, but there is a lot of interest in it. So interest is picking up, you know, it's being recognised as a sort of stepping stone to Passive House. And it has a lot of the quality assurance in there embedded in from Passive House embedded into this standard. So you can see the air oh, tightness so. is. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Sarah, I was going to say with, with Enerfit, like Passive House then, and if you have AECB retrofit standard, is there a fee for to be to to say you've achieved the um, benefit standard like you would for Passive House? Yeah. yeah. So with Passive House, it's a third party independent certifier that has to mm. certify that. Um, yeah. With AECB, it can be self certified. Um, usually, you need somebody who knows how to use the Passive House tool calculation energy tool. Um, so it's usually a passive house consultant or somebody, you know, that's done a lot of retrofit before somebody mm -hmm. quite tech, but they can sign it off themselves. You don't need then another independent third party person. Right, okay. um, and it's all, all the projects are put on the low energy building database, which I recommend everybody goes and has a look at. So we can see that the building standard has a space eating demand target of around 40. So it's a lot more lenient than passive house at 15. And the retrofit standard, you need to get down to 50 kilowatt hours per meter squared annum. But they've actually got a exemption up to 100. So this is recognising buildings that perhaps can only have internal wall insulation um, or they've got some heritage significance. Um, so it's it, it sort of recognises the variety in retrofit. Um, and also they, they're a bit more focused on retrofit risks such as moisture and fire and flood and radon and overheating, whereas you don't get that so much in Passive House. So that's the ACB standard. Um, and then I thought it was worth mentioning PAS 2035, 2030, because it's often known as a retrofit standard. Um, it's a guidance document and it came out of each home counts review on the installation of energy efficiency measures in homes. Um, and it recognised that there's a lot of risks when you're doing retrofit and you can make things a lot worse when you retrofit a building. Um, so they wrote this standard past 2035, 2030. Peter Rickaby wrote it with BSI. And it's a, it's a process, really. It's not an energy standard. It's, it's not a comfort standard as such. It's a process for assessment, design, installation and evaluation of retrofits. However, it does have some things in it that talk about continuous air barriers, surface temperature factors, so thermal bridging, and you need to have really good ventilation. So it's got things in there that recognise the need to reduce risks in retrofit. Um, there's a lot of government funding available for retrofit. I mean, it's a drop in the ocean in, in the wider scheme of things, but two and a half billion pounds is available between 2020 and 2025. Now, only a fraction of that is being taken up at the moment. Um, so this is the problem. It's 
the industry is still getting used to the standard, but the projects are growing rapidly. Um, and you find that some of the government funding that's coming out, like the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund, SHDF, does require a space heating demand target. And that was 50 in the first round, and now they've gone up to 90, I think, in wave two. Um, and there's quite a lot of pushback from the industry that it's too expensive to do this retrofit process. So a bit of work to be done um, on that one, but it is definitely helping bring up standards in the industry. And then we come on to energy sprung, um, which you may have heard of, a bit of a buzzword at the moment. Uh, and this is actually a business case rather than a specification. However, the idea behind energy sprung is that the, the retrofit is paid for in savings on the energy bills of the person in the home. So that requires a certain level of specification in order to be able to do that. So there is an energy sprung specification. Now, um, they've done quite a few pilots in the UK of energy sprung, and there are some larger projects, especially in London, that are scaling up now. The good thing about energy sprung is they have loads of monitoring and metering data because they have to, right? Because otherwise the business case wouldn't work. So they need to know that this works and that it can be paid back. What they found is that they are meeting their space eating demand target of between 40 and 50 on average, but that there's a huge range. And obviously this is, depends a lot on um, occupant behavior, but they're not sure whether there's a performance gap in there as well. Um, they found that tenants are operating their homes around two degrees warmer than expected and that they are struggling to improve air tightness and deal with the underfloor insulation efficiently with their system because it's supposed to be a very quick system that bolts onto the outside of the buildings as you can see in the photos. I would really recommend there's some great findings from their pilot projects that they put on their website there's a link there um, if you go to the Energy Sprung website they've got their top 10 findings uh, really, really worth a read. And it's very, um, it's very introspective of them. You know, they're very honest about how they're doing and how these pilots are going. So, right, oh, this is a graph I was talking about earlier. So this sort of puts everything in context. So is your space heating demand along the bottom. And these bars here are our existing uh, properties. So it's UK housing stock as existing. And you can see that we're averaging about 130 kilowatt hours per meter squared annum. Typical new builds down here between sort of 60 and 80 now. AECB and Letty retrofit 50. Um, Enerfit component methods, that's a slightly different way of getting passive house retrofit by just looking at the U values of different components. You could probably um, certify that between about 30 and 40 kilowatt hours per meter squared annum. If you're going for True benefit is 25, and if you're going to pass fast new build, it's 15. So you can see the sort of scale of all the different retrofit standards there. So, <clears throat> I mean, passive house is great. There's lots of things we can learn from passive house, particularly about quality control and the way that we design buildings. But it's not particularly cost effective, especially when you're talking about individual homes. So, can we still get a good retrofit using an essence of benefit? And I've got a couple more case studies to share with you that show some of the things we're thinking about in more cost effective retrofit. Um, but as I say, quality assurance and quality control is really important part of the passive house process. And we need that quality assurance at design stage. So you're preventing any defects in building performance. This is. And then during construction stage, you need somebody who is looking for those defects now. Building control should be doing a lot of this, but they, they aren't always. Um, so I often find that I have a role around looking at air tightness, installation of air tightness barriers and design of air tightness barriers, um, thermal bridging, recommending products, making sure they're installed correctly, making sure insulation is installed correctly with no gaps. It sounds obvious, but it, you know it, these little things make a big difference. And then around moisture risk, which is a difficult subject which not everybody um, understands. So let's have a look at this case study. This is with Connexus Warmer Homes and it's funded by ERDF, European Regional Development Fund. So they're looking at over a hundred existing homes across Hereford and Shropshire to retrofit them to very high levels 
And the original desire was to look at NFIT um, type retrofit in a sort of um, a step by step approach. So they were just going to do external wall insulation and but to NFIT standards. And the scope changed. You know, we had COVID, we had um, construction costs went through the roof. Um, and what we decided would be most cost, cost effective was actually to, in this first phase to have a look at these Cornish style units that had no insulation in at all, um, maybe a tiny bit in the roof. And uh, they, we, it meant we could clad the whole building. So we were looking at external wall insulation and going up and over the roof. So like a warm jacket on the whole thing. So we take one detail. This is external wall insulation applied to um, the Cornish unit prefab concrete structure, which did have a small cavity in it. And ideally, we want to go down below ground because that gets rid of that thermal bridge. Um, you know, the further we can go down below ground, the better. So we've got our external wall insulation here with a plinth detail that's as thick as the rest of the insulation that goes down below ground. Um, however, when we went to the building, this is what we're dealing with in reality. So this is a sketch uh, plan of the perimeter of the building. I don't know if you can just about see these letters here. So we've got G for gully, R for rainwater, gully, gully, gully. Um, and then we've also got these uh, unidentified concrete objects that are in the ground. You can just see one here circled in red on the right. We think they might have been some form of piling, but we're not sure. Um, so we didn't really want to dig them out. Uh, and find out. Um, so you can see, and then all of around the ends of the building, this is all hard standing, so this is all concrete. So the only grass bit really is, is in the middle of the building. Um, now that, it provides some significant challenges about going down below ground. And you will find on any building you look at challenges. I mean, it may be easy on some, um, in which case go for it, but it got me thinking as a building physicist, what do we do about this? So we did some modelling. Um, so on the left here, we've got our standard detail that used to be installed all the time for external wall insulation. So no plinth detail, massive thermal bridge um, through the bottom there. And then uh, on the right hand side, we've got our ideal detail coming down below ground. Uh, in a passive house, you might go right down to the foundations, but you know we're, we're being a bit pragmatic about this. And then we had a look at the halfway house for so going to the ground because we figured, well, we can go to the ground. Um, that's probably the easiest thing to do. We're not having to deal with anything below the ground. And what we found was that actually, so FRSI is the surface temperature factor, which tells us about the how cold that internal surface is going to be. And it tells us whether we're going to have a risk with condensation on that internal surface. Now, PAS 2035 says it needs to be 0.75 or above for all junctions. Um, and there's sort of similar advice elsewhere in various British standards. So we found that if you don't do anything with this detail in a solid floor situation, then you get you're at risk of having um, the too, too cold, basically, on the inside of your uh, wall. Whereas if you insulate down to the ground or below ground, you end up with a really nice high surface temperature factor. So it's much warmer there. Um, and in terms of actual measuring heat loss, you get three quarters of the way there by going to the ground. And that's because air is so good at displacing heat. The ground is really quite slow at displacing heat, um, whereas air is really good. So if you can just block off that air path to the wall, it makes a huge difference. So that's what we did. Um, that's what was recommended. And a lot of the industry are doing this now, actually, um, going down to the ground where they can't go below ground. And you can see we've got a really nice good seal here, no air gap to the ground. Now, my only um, <clears throat> takeaway from this really actually is the, you can see just there, you can see the gully that's been left. Mm -hmm. So they didn't move the gullies out. Um, and that is going to be a thermal bridge right there. Now, we don't know what's, what's behind here, you know, whether it's a kitchen cupboard or something behind there, but we, you'd need to monitor that. You need to be aware that that's a thermal bridge and that, that there may be some a cold patch on the other side just there. So ideally, we'd have moved the gullies out, but they decided not to in this case. Other winds, um, so gaps in insulation. So gaps in insulation like this can make a huge difference to the thermal performance. Um, 
of the insulation. So getting them to stuff with spare bits of rock wall stuff in the gaps. Uh, now, obviously, most of it was fine. So it didn't take particularly long time to go around and identify these gaps and fill them in. The other things is just getting the right equipment for the right hole, so penetrations. Um, these are all sealed with an expandable foam against the insulation. Now, obviously, if you've got a square hole with a round penetration, that's not going to give you a very good seal. So they found a round cutting tool in order to get that really good seal around penetrations. And we're starting to see an air barrier being installed. So PAS 2035 talks about air barriers. Um, building regulations now talks about continuous air barriers. And we're starting to see it. Now, I'm not going to claim this is the finest taping you'll ever see. Um, but the fact is it's there. Um, we don't normally see this, especially in retrofit. So that's great news. Uh, so lovely drone footage of our four units that we retrofit. And there's some more on another site. Um, but yeah, you can see finished product and some uh, halfway through being finished. So a lot of work to do, but um, because of the introduction of PAS 2035-2030, uh, we are starting to see more people questioning thermal bridging and also you're starting to see air tightness appear in retrofit, which is great. So this is the final case study, which is a slightly different, we're moving away from the fabric now a little bit and looking a bit more at building services. Um, so this is a completely different project in a sense. It, it's always oh, still no fine, same as the first one, but it's high rise, it's in Scotland. Um, it's 15 stories, 90 flats. It's already had cladding on it that's been removed because of health and safety issues. So the render was failing on it. Um, it's got mechanical extract. And interestingly, it's connected to a, ba a biomass gas district heating system. And there's heat exchanges in each flat. So it's already quite complicated. Um, so the fabric is almost the easy bit. As I said before, large buildings, when you look at passive house standards and ACB standards, they're measured by the amount of external internal floor area that you've got compared to the external surface area. So you find that these large buildings don't need the really low U values in order to get to quite good space heating demand targets. And actually, the current air tightness was pretty good in this building. You know, we've got 3.8, 4.6 air changes for a single flat with no co-pressure testing. So that's amazing. Um, but we are going to put a new air barrier on under the external wall insulation. And we are going to put new triple glazed windows on under the, um, in line with the external wall insulation. We're not going to do the roof because that has been done in the last 10 years, I think. So we think there's 100 mil of insulation in there somewhere. Um, so we've just got to make sure we join up the external wall insulation with the roof insulation. So that's kind of the easy bit. Uh, but if we start looking at the services, um, so we've got two biomass boilers and two gas boilers in this district heating centre, which actually happens to be right next door to the, this particular block. Um, and they provide domestic hot water and space heating, which means we've got a very high temperature pipe work inside our building all year round, pumping out heat. And there's a heat exchange unit in every flat, which is warm most of the time because people want hot water straight away. So my first reaction is, is that district heating system increasing the risk of overheating, especially if we insulate these buildings and make them more airtight? Are we going to see an overheating risk? We've got eight metres of district heating pipe work within the flats which is insulated with high performance insulation. So, you know, it's not completely exposed, but we've also got 15 meters of hot water distribution within the flats, which are not hot all the time, but they still do get hot and this heat exchange unit as well. So we had a look at the second to top floor flat because we didn't pick the top floor flat because there'd be a lot more heat loss through the roof. So we picked the second one down on the Southwest elevation because that'd be our worst case. Sorry, there's a lot on this slide, but what we found was that um, we kept the windows closed and we added the pipework and the heat exchanger in. And you can see the difference in overheating. So 3% um, overheating with the windows closed, 90% overheating with the windows closed when you include the pipework and heat exchanger. Now, these problems go away, either the overheating gets really low when you open your windows. However, 
Um, you know, we don't know about the noise, the pollution, the security, et cetera, et cetera, of this block. So we can't um, assume that people are going to be able to open their windows when they need to. So we kind of need this to work as well as we can without having loads of window opening just to solve all our problems. Um, and you can see this is a graph of all the different internal heat gains in order. Um, so you can see all the appliances here. This is a detail you have to go into when you're modeling for passive house. And people, they're really good at giving internal heat gains, but you can see this is the circulation pipe, the hot water, the individual pipes for the hot water, and then the heat exchange unit. So they're the biggest internal heat gains. And you can see providing a big portion of the heat gains equal to the heating demand in this case. So high rise, the fabric is the cost effective bit. You know, we think, oh yeah, we'll get to benefit then, that's great. Um, but we've got all these building services challenge, you know, so if it's not district heating, it's something else. How do you get the heating and hot water to everybody? Unless everybody's got individual gas boilers already um, without increasing overheating. Is it affordable to change the low temperature? If we change it all to air source heat pumps and a low temperature distribution system, is that affordable for the tenants? Is it affordable for the housing association? And then the other thing is, you know, you saw in that previous slide, look at the losses side. So we've dealt with the fabric, but look at the ventilation, biggest heat loss now, because we've got um, just, we're just pulling fresh air in. We're not doing heat recovery on it. So if we wanted to do mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, then there's many, many more problems. You know, the risers weren't big enough, but we could put one in each flat, but then we've got two penetrations per flat on our air barrier. And then you've got to change 90 filters every six months as a housing association. Is that affordable? You know, um, so lots and lots of questions around building services, which we haven't got an answer to just yet. I mean, we're sticking with MEV in this one, mechanical extract ventilation, uh, because they just felt that was the right place for them, this particular house association to be, River Clyde Homes. Um, and it was a pretty good system that's in there already. So they've got a centralised extract on the roof. Um, but maybe it's something they could look at in the future. Uh, so messages are, um, yes, we can do simpler details or less insulation, but let's make sure we get rid of that performance gap, whatever standard we're going for. So make sure we're actually delivering on site what we want, we've designed. Um, let's avoid unintended consequences. Let's think about moisture risks and make sure we really understand the building before we retrofit it. And then quality control, so making sure we've got the right skilled people on site and the right people inspecting those buildings to make sure they come out as we want them to. So that's it for me. I'll um, stop sharing my screen and we can have some questions. Unmute myself. Thank you very much, Sarah. Fantastic. Very interesting. Um, Alex has asked, actually, he asked um, pretty much early, early doors. He was just going back to um, your first case study in terms of do you have any post occupancy data on how effective single room heat recovery is? Um, no, we don't. I really would have loved to have some post occupancy data on that project, but unfortunately, they didn't monitor it. Thank you, Dave. Fair enough. Um, and in terms of um, the external cladding, so is there not a high risk of moisture tracking under insulation when it only goes to ground level? But then you've sort of covered, sorry, you covered that in your presentation, didn't you? Um, so is, is there not a yeah, high it, risk of moisture? Yeah. It's a special type of insulation you have to use. You know, you use a different product from the main external wall insulation system and it's covered in a, um, they use like a, 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 I think they use a board and then they use um, like a bitumen paint on the front of it as well. So, uh, and then it's sealed. It is sealed underneath too. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and Alex, I don't know whether you want to come off mute because I know that you, as a passive house consultant, but with it, do you do much stuff? Um, you might want to answer in chat or come off, come off mute. Do you do much stuff on a retrofit basis? Because um, it's interesting what Sarah's saying here and recognizing that, you know, in a fit really only, the projects need to be medium to large size projects in order for them to be um, workable. So it'd be interesting to um, hear what you're doing. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? We can indeed, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I'm, I'm, 
I'm doing a lot of work in retrofit at the moment. So it's, it's, it's over the last kind of eight months, as nearly all my new clients have been retrofit rather than new bills. Um, but no one actually wants to actually get to NFIT standard. Everyone kind of is interested in an AECB or a LETI type standards. Um, there is nearly all individual dwellings. So it would be hard to get to NFIT on nearly all the projects. Um, and it's a real mix of how much money people have got from a couple of tens of thousands to you know half a million pounds. So it's very variable. Um, and what I'm finding the kind of difficult things to deal with is, is partly the kind of lack of information available. You know, and I was just typing up a question right now is, is there a, a resource available, for instance, for typical side values on existing housing stock? Or as a consultant, are you just spending a lot of time modeling stuff all the time? Because I think until we can get beyond consultants spending lots of time modeling everything to the nth degree, it's going to be really expensive to do on just on the consultancy side before you even pay for the works. Yeah, absolutely. So we're starting to see um, where there's like critical details, like that ground detail I showed you. So that work was actually also done by, um, I think it might have been Swiga, I can't remember, it was one of the insulation certification bodies and they circulated it around the industry basically. And it was essentially what I've just shown, you know, it said try and go to the ground if you can. So we're starting to see the industry respond to that kind of thing so that you're not having to get a consultant to redo it, you know, for every project. And we're learning what the best practice detail looks like, if you see what I mean. But it's not consistent and it's not all in one place, I'm afraid. Right. So no one's, no one's, you're not writing a book, are you, at the moment? <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, I, I can highly recommend Marion Bailey's book, though. You've probably got that, though, uh, which is Retrofit, Residential Retrofit. She's looking at it. Make a note of that one. And then, Alex, are you, how did your clients, because when, yeah, understandably, they weren't interested necessarily trying to achieve benefit, but how did they even know about, um, you know, Letty's guidance? Or are you advising them then? You just giving them the different um, standards? So should... nearly all of my clients find me through the AECB or the Passive House Trust. So they've generally done some research already. Okay. Um, and kind of the work that Letty's done recently, I think is really it's very client friendly um so that's you know it's kind of a good starting point there's some nice clear graphics that explain what what are sensible targets to achieve mm -hmm. um so that's kind of a, a good starting point obviously it's lots of i think it's very similar to the acb stuff but just maybe a, a bit easier to understand got cool. some nice graphics cheers alex and then and then um sarah going back to was it will yeah, is it Wilmcote or Wilms Wilmcote House? Yeah. Yeah. That. Um, now, what drove that then? I presume there was a lot of funding behind it, but but why? Why? You know, I mean, obviously, it's trendsetters there. What What was the why? Um, I wasn't involved at the early stage of the project, but from what I've seen of it written up, um, they did produce a business case for it. Mm -hmm. um and i and i'm guessing they would have looked at the commercial side and the social side and everything in, within that um and they just found that enfit worked for them you know in that particular building um so yeah it wasn't i don't think it was particularly more costly than um doing you know just a, I don't know what you call a normal retrofit to it right okay okay and, yeah okay now we had um, alan watkins on um previous week if it wasn't last week it was the, it was the week before um and he was he was, again he was saying you know social housing is, is sort of re really leading the way when it comes to um the category that's driving retrofit um, mm -hmm. um yeah it really is i mean they have some of the best housing stock in the uk now i know we often think yeah. of social housing as being full of damp and mold but actually the the in terms of insulation and retrofit they are way ahead of where the rest of the sort of private market is yeah yeah yeah, definitely yeah because emma osmerson she was on as well and um you know i think the, the tenants or the people who are living in you know social housing in in this area they do very very well indeed because everything's done to um um very high standard from a retro retrofit perspective i don't know this person's name has got a like a moniker three four five one truey um 
couple of was there a question there? I just um, made a point on the uh, boiler on the NFIT house was smaller than the affordable house. Um, oh yeah, so was the boiler smaller in the NFIT house than the affordable house? That's no, because what what you find is that it's a hot water demand that drives it, and it's very difficult to reduce hot water demand down. Um, so they were very similar. Okay, thank you. And um, I was it, he's right, or they are um, suggesting on the tower block would an optimized heat station in the plant room linked to sensors and weather forecast? Will it take heat load and weather into consideration? Don't know if you can read that. Uh, I would have thought so. Um, you know, it's a fairly a, a new and advanced um, uh, district heating sort of energy centre. Mm -hmm. So I would have thought it would have all of those weather compensation, etc. Okay, okay, cool. So what I'll I'll do is because it's interesting to hear about the low energy build database. I'll I'll, um, I'll share that on the on the notes when I upload the video and Energy Scrum UK as well. It might be quite nice to get someone in from them actually um, to talk mm. about this subjects as well so I'll, I'll do that if anyone on the call anyone if, if anyone wanted to suggest anyone that I should contact and um to talk on this space that that would be that would be great we've got um Nigel Banks from Ilka Homes coming on soon and he's not necessarily going to be talking about what they're doing from as a housing developer what they're doing from a sustainability issue he just seems to want to have an argument with someone so he suggested I contact a number of people to get um, to have the debate around whether it need be passive house, active house, or just sort of building regs plus, really, um, in terms of um, achieving low carbon homes um, and energy efficient homes. So we've got a number of threads that are going to splinter off 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 this, and and not least, obviously, this follows up from the conversation that we had with Alan last week or the week before. Everything's starting to blur into one. Um, yeah, we've coming up to 45 minutes, so that was quite nice timing, actually. If anyone has any any more questions, then please ask ahead. Alex, I don't know whether you um, have any more, but um, yeah, otherwise, Sarah, thank you very much indeed for taking the time out of your day to talk to us today. Um, hope everyone found it of interest. I'm sure they did. And um, yeah, like I say, I'll upload these uh, the notes and the video tomorrow. And if anyone would like a CPD certificate, then please contact me and we'll we will send them out. But um, Sarah, great stuff. Thank you very much. Oh, no. Thank they you for inviting me. Oh. Yeah, they're just saying thank you. <laughs> thank cool. you, everyone. Cool. Cheers then, guys. Thanks a lot. See you next. Oh, we have a, we have a webinar tomorrow um, with Seblan Lomas on building performance evaluation. So if anyone would like to join that that's not currently registered, then please do. Cheers. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Bye.